this. This is insanity. Um, I like to quote Albert Einstein. He said that when he was asked what he thought the basic difference between <clears throat> genius and stupidity was, and he never even blinked, he just said, genius has its limits. Could our way of life collapse? Could industrial civilization collapse? And I think it's a genuine worry. We have tremendous problems generated by ourselves and limited mental capacity to deal with them. There's no doubt in my mind, none whatsoever, that there, there are catastrophes looming for our children and grandchildren that uh, are almost unimaginable to us. We've built this magnificent structure, set of structures, that empowers us, but you have to put quotes around that, that word because we're not really empowered if anything breaks down in that system. Or, conversely, if we, if we decide the system is unsustainable, that there are problems in that system, we're really stuck. This is what I see as the greatest threat to our future where complexity and costliness make it impossible to solve our problems as we've been accustomed to doing. Each time we get a wake-up call, as we now like to call it, we wake up briefly and then we go right back to, uh, I'll think about that tomorrow. There are huge concepts here, like what is reality, what is truth? We're three and four generations away from the farm. We've got people that think that there's a machine in the back of the Piggly Wiggly that makes the food. I mean, they have no idea. You know, the west coast of this nation has five days of food, five days. We are playing a an intrinsically dangerous game because we are cutting ourselves off from reality and that can come back and not just to haunt us but we can smack into reality in a very dramatic way because it's unexpected. To deal with climate change only on the level of political theory or on the level of scientific facts is extremely superficial. We have to investigate what it is in the deep structure of the human mind that just makes us unable to move in the face of cognitive intellectual insight into the facts, but even also in the face of conscious experience of the situation we find ourselves. As a species, we have evolved under natural selection, just as all animal species evolved. And in our history, there was never selective pressure. There was never pressure to think more broadly in terms of either time or space. And so humans didn't evolve to do so. Yet that's precisely what sustainability today requires. Particularly, it requires us to understand the distant past because the distant past gives us lessons. And it also tells us how we came to be in the circumstances that we're in today. And we have to understand how to take the lessons of the past and project them into the future. We have to anticipate what the future is going to be like. Humans don't tend to think in terms of the long-term future. They think in terms of the immediacy of their lives. Obviously, if we're concerned about the future of humanity, the future of our planet, we have to really think in terms of, of the future. We have to think in, in the long term. Natural selection doesn't do that, never has done that. There is no foresight, there is no forethought, no looking ahead in nature. The human species is the only species that has even the slightest chance of looking ahead, slightest chance of using foresight. And we do, and we are the, in a way the best hope for the future of the world because of that. But nevertheless, we've got strong relics of our evolutionary past, it's a struggle for us to break away from the lack of foresight, the short-termness, which is uh, which bedeviled the whole of the rest of the natural world. You know, 
at our evolutionary history essentially tells us where we come from and why we are the way we are to, to this day. It, but it doesn't really tell us where we're going. Um, we're, in a, we're in a world now where the future matters and yet we're still wired for the here and now. Evolution has invented many things. It has invented emotions, it has invented color vision, it has invented the conscious sense of selfhood, and it has obviously also invented self-deception. We now have changed every cubic meter of air and water, and every hectare of land on Earth now has a human imprint. We are moving into a new era, and the question is, are we the kind of creature, are we the kind of being that can handle this new epoch, the Anthropocene, that we have created? Throughout history, there's been conflict, but actually humans are really evolved to get on with each other in groups. It's when those groups are in conflict, fighting over the resources, that you have the wars and the battles. And of course, you can always land grab for more territory. But what happens when you run out of territory? What happens when you run out of land? There's almost nothing we can exploit in terms of space on this planet anymore. We're exploiting time now. So we're destroying the quality of life of future human beings on this planet. We know that we do it. The Aina is our land, yeah, the Aina. Why do certain groups, even those who aren't perpetuating a problem, why are they taking action to benefit future generations in ways that would, say, help them overcome problems of climate change? The, the Hawaiian word ai is to eat, so mea ai is the food. So aina is the land, mea ai is the food. And just this area alone here we know could feed families, it could feed a lot of people. And once we get it going, it's just maintaining it and keeping it in production. Whatever we put into the aina, we put into our body. So if you put poison into the aina, you're only going to put poison into yourself. If you could put good mana, good life force into the aina, you put it into yourself. Yeah, so we are all connected, the, the body and the aina. So no matter where you are, you always have aina. You take care of your aina, you malama aina. You taking care of your ancestor, your ancestral lands, because our ancestors are buried in the aina, the bones. So we always walk with them, especially when you come into a place like this. They are all around us. And so it is our kuleana, our responsibility to to maka ala, to become aware, to raise your awareness of your kupuna and of your ancestral lands, which is inside here. This whole kino, the body and the aina, is one. People do things largely because, in one way or another, enhances their own well-being and enhances their own interests and welfare. The difference is what people do to enhance their well-being. So Kupuna, our ancestors, they utilize aquaculture and agriculture, yeah? And they integrate the two. So not only we can farm the food, but we can farm fish along with the food. If you live in a farming society where there's all kinds of things that, you know, affect your survival chances, future-orientedness suddenly becomes a matter of life and death. It becomes really important. And uh, we live down over here. This is the last four farms that are remaining out of all this area. Polynesians developed a highly complex society in Hawaii that was sustainable entirely on local resources. They had no hope of getting resources from outside, and they didn't need resources from outside. The psychology necessary for that future orientedness, one way in which it's cultivated is through the development of deep genealogies where you think about your ancestors going back through numerous generations and then project forward. 
our kupuna had it had it figured out. They had to, they had to figure it out. Because we're in this, we're on this island. We, there's no place to go. Captain James Cook came. Over one million Hawaiians living in the islands, one million. After 2,000 years of living out here in isolation, they were one million strong. Today, we have about 1.2, maybe 1.4 million people today. We import 90% of our food. We 90% depend on fossil fuels. And we still get people homeless. Whatever we take, we want to make sure that the next guy that come after us enjoy the same things we enjoy. Common psychological instinct when faced with a problem is to try to figure out who the antagonist is or who the perpetrator of the problem is. Ultimately, we all do things that serve our own interests, but the things that we do have different implications for people. What's well, taught to me, everything we do today impact the next seven generations. The next seven, bro. Just think about this. What if there was no more barges, no more boats, no more ships, no more airplanes flying into Hawaii? How many of you guys think we're going to survive? Hawaii is an example of how we have transformed places and ourselves from environments in which humans and the environment were symbiotic to environments that can only be sustained by continual input of outside resources, all ultimately dependent on fossil fuels. And here we are in the wettest place in the world. Yeah. And we yeah. drink bottled water. I know. We can consume most anything we want. And so we, we tend to think, since we grew up in such a society, that this is the normal human condition. In fact, it's not normal. It's highly unusual in human history. And there are questions about how long it can continue. The golf course takes a lot of water. They, they own several springs on their side, rivers. It's the fertile resources and the food producing areas and the medicine areas and all the upland areas that they own and um, really don't probably have an idea of, of what they have um, uh, under their control. Our local ia is our food stock, our refrigerator, our cabinet, our food source. So we want to build this wall, we want to bring the rocks back up to, its, to its, uh, the highest point of the highest tide. And so what we want to do is we want to farm the fish and we want to use the natural life cycle of the fish so we don't overtake. We are all in the same canoe. We're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on, on these little islands, these little specks. No place to go. As Hawaiians, we understand that concept that these guys are the ones that are going to live forever, but our time so short. How would it change if there were no legacy of me, of you, of any of us? I think that would profoundly alter the way we think about ourselves, our lives, and our place on this planet. This is the pula pula. This is the baby that grows off of it that we break off the oha. And we're going to plant this and it's going to have its own family and it's going to create future generations. So this just continues to carry on and on. And what we do is we cut the leaf here. We're still surviving. We're still here. So what are we, go what are we going to do for the ones that come after us? And this is what we eat and this is what we plant. So this part of the plant here is called the ha, and ha is the breath, the breath of life that carries on. So very symbolic that this is our seedling that we plant over and over again.